And now for our featured presenter. Dr. Neil Fishback is an oncologist currently with three year with nearly three decades rather of experience in treating patients with cancer. He currently practices in the Academic Medical Center. Dr. Fishback is passionate about ensuring all patients have equitable access to clinical trials and also generously gives his time and expertise in working with nonprofits serving patients with cancer. He is a member of multiple medical societies and committees and has over 20 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Fishback is an expert at treating patients with advanced breast cancer and providing personalized cancer care, which you will see reflected in his presentation today. And if you attended his previous webinar, you'll know just how wonderful a presenter he is. So welcome to you, Dr. Fishback. Oh, Rick, thanks again for that kind uh, import. Um introduction. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you from about 30 miles south of New Haven. I hope everyone's having a good morning. And we are going to talk today about comprehensive genomic profiling and why P10 matters in hormone receptor positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer. Um, uh, these are my disclosures. And again, our agenda is going to focus a bit on um, comprehensive genomic profiling, some background in theory, uh, and some practicalities about why P10 matters in advanced breast cancer, its implications for the type of comprehensive genomic profiling we're doing, and we'll even chat about one brand new FDA indication for inavolizib. So why is comprehensive genomic profiling important? And this slide is a cycle that I think is critical for us to uh, change our thinking, or many of us have already evolved our thinking about genomic profiling in the care of patients with metastatic HR positive HER2 negative breast cancer. That genomic profiling is critical for our detecting guideline recommended clinically relevant genomic alterations in biomarkers so we can match our patients with FDA approved therapies as well as identify patients for clinical trials. And the reason I like the circle of this slide is that I think it is a circle which we should th be thinking about repeating at multiple junctures in patients' care. And I think this is something that's really evolving in comprehensive genomic, genomic profiling from when this was just introduced as a new technology and we all had a sense of, wow, this is a great technique that we'll be able to use once and that insurance will no longer reimburse it for us. So we need to think of carefully about when do we wanna use it? Do we wanna use it at time of presentation, first progression, second progression, because we can only do it once to now evolving to, this is a technology that we should be thinking about probably at every uh, juncture uh, in therapy. And in particular, thinking about when is it appropriate for us to use tissue-based genomic profiling, and when uh, might we be able to use uh, blood-based circulating tumor DNA profiling? And we're going to start today uh, with a case study of a 38-year-old woman with estrogen receptor positive, HER2 low, uh, recurrent uh, metastatic breast cancer, a woman who'd received neoadjuvant therapy, surgery, adjuvant hormonal therapy that included a CDK4-6 inhibitor, uh, but who had recurred, unfortunately, within 12 months of finishing uh, her endocrine therapy. And now we're at a stage of trying to decide what's the most appropriate therapy for this woman. And again, uh, we have evolved uh, to a current state where comprehensive genomic profiling is appropriate. Um, there are now really three families of molecular abnormalities that we might pick up uh, at time of initial uh, diagnosis that have very relevant uh, implications. I see even more than three families. I think just germane particularly to breast cancer specific treatment, we might pick up an ESR1 mutation, about 30% of patients with metastatic breast cancer who've received prior adjuvant endocrine therapy may have an ESR1 mutation at the time of their initial diagnosis. That may be relevant therapeutically. Uh, and more appropriately in terms of FDA indications, uh, detecting PI3 kinase mutations uh, or AKT pathway mutations are now directly therapeutically relevant. And what we're going to talk a bit about is why tissue-based genomic profiling at the time of initial diagnosis is particularly important uh, for a comprehensive assessment of P10 um, abnormalities, particularly P10 loss. So, 
at the time of initial diagnosis, it generally is not a struggle for us to get tissue because we've done a biopsy to, to confirm metastatic breast cancer. But also important to recognize that at the time of initial diagnosis, if a patient has relatively low level of metastatic disease and they may have a low rate of tumor shedding, their CT DNA tumor fraction, that's the amount of tumor related CT DNA to the total amount of circulating fluid DNA, may be less than 1%. Uh, and as we'll see in a moment, that can significantly reduce the sensitivity of molecular profiling to detect genomic abnormalities. Um, Foundation 1 CDX is the companion diagnostic test for capivacertib and fulvestrant for patients with uh, recurrent or metastatic hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer uh, that have AKT pathway abnormalities. Importantly, uh, in the Capitello trial, you were eligible if you had recurred within 12 months of finishing your adjuvant therapy, whether or not you had received a CDK4-6 inhibitor uh, with that adjuvant therapy. And also, as we'll see in a moment, P10 loss is much better detected with tissue-based comprehensive genomic profiling than circulating tumor DNA. So what kinds of alterations might we pick up uh, by comprehensive genomic profiling? Uh, we can uh, detect substitutions, uh, indels, which is a amalgam of insertions and deletions, uh, copy number uh, alterations, uh, as well as rearrangements. These are the four types of genomic um, alterations. Uh, but importantly, uh, with um, um, gene loss, um, that can be very tricky for us to pick up uh, by blood-based uh, ctDNA profiling. And <clears throat> one way to think about this, um, this is a graph looking at uh, the percent of positive agreement between tissue-based genomic profiling and circulating tumor DNA profiling. And we can see with uh, our mutations uh, single, and insertions deletions, we actually do really well uh, with uh, agreement that's well over 90%. But when we look at gene loss, uh, the agreement is uh, much lower uh, between uh, circulating tumor DNA and tissue-based uh, testing. Um, and that, again, is uh, demonstrated here where we're segregating these results uh, by the tumor fraction. So again, on our last webinar, we reviewed the importance of recognizing what the tumor fraction in your specimen is. That's the amount of circulating tumor DNA divided by the total amount of circulating fluid DNA, tumor DNA plus normal DNA. And when that fraction is low, uh, we get less confident in the results of our um, circulating tumor DNA analysis. But less confident, what I mean is, if you have a positive, you've detected an insertion, deletion, uh, or a copy number, or, or a single mutation, you can be really confident that's present in the tumor DNA. But if you don't have a molecular abnormality, um, that, that's what's called a uh, ambiguous uh, negative or an uninformative negative, and you really want to consider tissue-based testing in that uh, situation. And here on the bottom is, is a really, I think, uh, instructive uh, graph of what do, what do we think about if our tissue fraction is less than 1%. Well, we see that the detection level in circulating tumor DNA decreases to around 40 50% at best in these low uh, tumor fraction um, samples. So again, if you detect an abnormality, that's a meaningful positive. But in these specimens with tumor fraction less than 1%, if you do not detect, uh, that is really an, an ambiguous negative, and we ought to consider uh, testing uh, tissue. And, and this is particularly prominent with, with gene loss, in this case P10 loss, or zero out of 19 uh, concordance from circulating uh, tissue tumor DNA uh, from tissue-based testing. This is another graphic way to look at that and thinking about what circulating tumor DNA tumor fraction do we need to achieve high levels of sensitivity for abnormalities. So for our base substitutions, our indels, fusions to detect MSI high status, uh, TMB high, we can see that with relatively low amounts of circulating tumor DNA tissue fraction, we can detect uh, these types of abnormalities. 
but especially when we get down to thinking about gene loss, and in the case we're thinking about P10 loss, uh, really even with significantly higher fractions of um, circulating tumor DNA, we still might miss uh, that very meaningful abnormality uh, on a circulating a tumor DNA analysis. And um, uh, this is uh, also meaningful that uh, P10 loss is not a rare problem. Uh, it, up to 6% roughly of patients uh, will have detectable uh, P10 loss uh, on tissue on third line of therapy. So this is not really a zebra we're looking for. It's a meaningful abnormality and uh, worthy of our uh, really making an effort to get tissue-based testing at some point uh, in therapy. And I would advocate that with uh, first uh, diagnosis of metastatic disease is a real opportune uh, time to do that. So. Uh, this patient did have tissue-based test, uh, and they were positive for P10 loss, and they had uh, no uh, other no the other mutations there, ESR1 and other uh, AKT pathway um, uh, mediators were wild type. And so this patient went on to receive uh, endocrine therapy uh, with a capivacertib uh, as first-line therapy. Uh, and this is data from the Capitella trial, which shows the dramatic impact uh, of that treatment on uh, progression-free survival nearly double uh, when appropriate targeted therapy was instituted. Um, so again, would not have a very low, much lower likelihood of our appreciating that AKT pathway loss, notably a P AKT pathway abnormality, uh, notable um, P10 loss without having done the tissue-based uh, profiling. So, moving on to well, why choose uh, foundation medicine profiling? I think this is, uh, from my perspective as a practicing breast oncologist, one of the most uh, important aspects, right? We are bombarded uh, by labs who are offering a comprehensive genomic profiling. I think the toughest thing for, for me to sort out is not so much how to interpret the results of an assay, but am I confident uh, in that assay? And so, uh, I think that Foundation One has really established themselves as a leader among the field in quality control and sensitivity. Uh, both the Foundation One CDX test and the Liquid CDX uh, have a long established uh, track record. Now we have the ability to add on RNA analysis to the um, DNA analysis that's done uh, with uh, Foundation Medicine. Uh, but I found them to be a really um, reliable partner uh, in caring for uh, my patients with metastatic breast cancer. And uh, of course, the, the, the tagline's important. We don't want to miss an opportunity uh, to get a patient appropriately targeted therapy, not only the breast cancer specific, but the tumor agnostic uh, abnormalities as well. And uh, so with that, I think we have arrived at time for questions. I'd be happy to answer any uh, questions that people may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Fishback. We do have some questions, so let's go right to the first. In my practice, I often use liquid biopsy tests because a blood sample is easier to collect, but I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. If no actionable findings are in the liquid biopsy results, am I correct in hearing that I should reflex to tissue to make sure nothing is missed? Yeah, uh, so I think that's a critical point. And I think that one thing we really do need to get used to is looking for that tumor fraction part of the report in our circulating tumor DNA. Uh, another really, I think, important thing to emphasize is that the time of very first diagnosis or at some point, um, tissue-based testing, if we can safely obtain it, uh, is important, particularly for P10 loss, because that's something, even if you're tumor fraction on a circulating tumor DNA assay is over 1%, uh, there's still a lot of P10 loss that you might miss. And that's an uh, abnormality that occurs with a, with a meaningful frequency of about 6%. Um, so I think trying to uh, get tissue, if it can be safely done uh, at time of initial diagnosis with uh, metastatic disease, I think it's a, it's a good way to do the algorithm. I have previously shared that in patients presenting in a semi-crisis situation where we're even still waiting for the diagnosis, is it breast cancer or not breast cancer, uh, I will often send both 
uh, I will send a circulating tumor DNA from the office when I see them the first time. And while I'm trying to arrange a tissue biopsy, uh, get the biopsy done, and then wait that slightly longer amount of time. Importantly, the turnaround time in the lab for circulating tumor DNA uh, and tissue-based CGP is quite similar. Uh, but the real lag is getting biopsy done and getting tissue to foundation medicine. And so it, generally in the time that it's taken for all that to happen, I already have uh, the um, CTDNA analysis back and can be making um, relevant decisions uh, about therapy. So I think that uh, in many situations, even doing both simultaneously is appropriate. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I assume that it is better to tissue test the biopsy of a metastasis rather than the initial diagnosis biopsy if both are available. What if that yeah. result differs from the initial biopsy? Yes. So I think that's an important point. Yes, uh, there can be some discordance between the primary tumor and the metastasis. That also is very true of um, estrogen, progesterone, and HER2 receptor status. So for those two critical reasons, uh, ideally we would perform molecular profiling uh, on the site of metastasis. If the site of metastasis though cannot be obtained, um, I think it is um, reasonable uh, in certain circumstances to uh, test the original tumor tissue. Again, that is um, suboptimal. And I would always strive to do the um, the metastatic site. Wonderful. Another good question coming up. Can archival material be tested? And how many years later is archival material still usable? Uh, yeah. So uh, the answer is, yes, it can be uh, tested. Uh, I think that trying to obtain fresh tissue obviously is uh, ideal, but sometimes that is just not possible. Um, the first step that uh, foundation medicine will do is to test the DNA quality. Uh, and if there is inadequate or poor quality DNA, you will get a, a notification that the, that the tumor, uh, that the specimen was inadequate. Uh, so we know pretty quickly um, whether it's a useful tissue or not. Um, I would also say, mention my own experience, and I think most pathology labs uh, are uh, evolving this way, that um, the harsh uh, fixation techniques that we used to use on bone for decalcification have largely given way to newer fixation techniques that will allow uh, genomic profiling to be performed from even uh, bone biopsy specimens. Uh, so I think that just because a specimen came from a bone biopsy does not mean that you cannot use it for profiling. Excellent and uh, very appropriate because the question just came in, can you please define how bone specimens should be prepared by the pathologist in bone-only diseases? Yeah. Um, so I, I think currently now the um, labs are using formic acid or EDTA decalcification techniques, which are much friendlier uh, to DNA. Uh, and uh, again, whether or not, uh, I actually have not been in, at, at our institution in the process of pre-specifying it's a bone biopsy coming and I want to do CGP, so be gentle with it. I think they have their own internal algorithms now for, for doing this, assuming that uh, CGP is going to be a priority on uh, all biopsies uh, that they're getting. Okay, wonderful. Uh, a couple more questions here. Uh, is the new drug in Avalisib, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, that's approved. fantastic. Oh, thank you. Well, it's a new drug, so I was just thinking. Yes. That. Approved for breast patients with P10 alterations. Ah, good question. Um, Boy, I, I don't see why it shouldn't be, but the answer is no. It was approved for uh, PI3 kinase mutations, but not, not entire uh, AKT pathway. Got it. Thank you. And last, if I am unable to re-biopsy my patient at the time of progression, can I use the original tissue sample to find Oops. all potential P10 alterations, including P10 loss? You know what, um, Rick, I, I missed the mid portion of that. You said if sure. I'm unable to re-biopsy. If I'm able to, uh, unable to re-biopsy my patient at the time of progression, can I use the original tissue sample to find all potential P10 alterations, including P10 loss? Um, y yes, you can. So uh, I guess the two questions that come up is, what's the chance of acquired 
P10 loss during later lines of therapy? Um, and is there heterogeneity, like we've noted with ESR1 mutations, where in fact in later lines of therapy, ctDNA may be preferable for trying to detect ESR1 mutations because you're in essence sampling all metastatic sites at once when you're doing ctDNA. Uh, again, given the sensitivity issues with ctDNA for P10 loss, that's that's not feasible. Um, I don't know that we have a handle on what's the rate of acquired P10 loss with subsequent lines of therapy. Uh, and uh, so my impression in practice is that yes, using uh, archival tissue from time of diagnosis with metastatic disease uh, is a acceptable um, tissue-based uh, way to get that answer. Wonderful, thank you. And we just did get one more question in. Uh, these are good questions, Luke, thank you. Is, uh, is comprehensive genomic testing synonymous with NGS? How ah. do different labs, yeah, and it's a twofer. How do different yeah. labs that do NGS differ in the information provided on their reports? Yeah, so this, uh, you are getting at the exact question of why use foundation medicine in my mind, because um, it's sort of like uh, uh, organic or not organic or all natural. Um, there, there is no uh, strict definition. Comprehensive genomic profiling in essence just means that you are comprehensively assessing the genomic features uh, of the tumor. And that can include uh, things from the, some people may call comprehensive genomic profiling a PCR based panel for the 50 most common relevant mutations in cancer and uh, other uh, labs uh, like foundation medicine may consider that comprehensive sequencing uh, and add on analyses to optimize detection of fusions deletions for panels of largely 350 uh, genes. Um, ne next generation sequencing, NGS, refers to how do labs do that. Uh, and this is really, I think, the secret sauce of labs like Foundation. Um, the engineering for how we sequence uh, and differentiate, uh, in it, for instance, in circulating tumor DNA, how do you differentiate circulating tumor DNA from native uh, DNA? How many reads do you get through a given gene, which increases confidence in results? These can really vary from lab to lab. Uh, and so I think to some extent we are at the mercy, and unless you happen to be a molecular biologist who knows everything about next generation sequencing, uh, you are kind of left to uh, make sure you are choosing a lab that has an extraordinary reputation uh, that has demonstrated a um, commitment to advancing the science of genomic profiling and next generation sequencing. And I think that gets to a pretty short list uh, of companies, which from my own personal preference uh, is uh, FMI. Wow, thank you so much for all of this great information and great answers to these very good questions, everyone. Thank you for those great questions. Fantastic.